It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, webinar and this session today. Uh, my name is Daniel Hooten. I'm the head of international programs for the Strong Cities Network. Um, I uh, am delighted to see a number of familiar faces and, and also to have uh, new names join us for this session, uh, which of course uh, looks at our membership uh, and the issues that affect our membership in cities across the South Asia region. So it's going to be a really important session today and I'm, I'm grateful for you all uh, for joining. I'd like to thank uh, our partners at the Presence Group for facilitating the uh, technical support for today's call and all of our speakers for giving their uh, time today to join us on this uh, session. Uh, this is uh, the first of three webinar sessions that comprise the SCN uh, South Asia Summit, which is virtual. We, uh, were it not for the circumstances of the pandemic that have been affecting us all, uh, we would actually find ourselves uh, meeting in person in, in Dhaka at the moment. So it's a matter of deep regret that we are not there in person. And I thank all of uh, our colleagues across the region for uh, your patience and understanding as we uh, uh, try and make this work over a virtual format. Of course, everybody is well used uh, to using Zoom and other platforms over the past uh, couple of years. And I hope that we can make this an engaging uh, and useful session to everybody who's, who's joining us. Over the course of uh, today's session, uh, we will be looking um, at the region more broadly. We'll have two panels. The first will look at the current uh, uh, challenges and really the sort of threat profile that exists across the South Asia region. region. Uh, we will hear from a number of distinguished speakers who will be able to give us perspectives from across the region. And I think really answer the questions uh, around not only what is going on at the moment and how that has changed, uh, over recent years, but also how it affects cities and local governments as they look to be uh, key partners in the response to uh, the issues uh, around violent extremism, polarization, uh, and hate more broadly across the region. Our second panel uh, will then look at how cities can work more effectively with multilateral institutions. We see widespread uh, multilateral efforts across the region um, including on violent extremism, uh, but cities very often are not necessarily the primary partners as they work with governments and civil society organizations and communities, but there is perhaps uh, some missing connective tissue and catalytic tissue, I would argue, between uh, governments and civil society in the form of cities. In case anybody is uh, not already familiar, the Strong Cities Network began in 2015 uh, we launched at the UN General Assembly initially with a membership of 25 cities. That membership globally has grown to now more than 150, including a healthy membership across the South Asia region. Uh, the network uh, serves to elevate the voices of mayors and local leaders, to connect local leaders uh, across uh, national divides, geopolitical uh, uh, issues, and to ensure that local practice can be shared effectively, good practices can be identified, and that uh, the scaling up of good work can happen in such a way that it's informed by local uh, perspectives and understanding and is tailored to local context. We also serve to elevate voices uh, of local mayors, governors, and leaders uh, up to national uh, and international levels so that policy uh, set at those levels is informed by those uh, who work day to day on facilitating uh, services and access at local levels and understand their communities perhaps better than most. In South Asia, our, our work has uh, uh, spanned uh, many countries and a number of issues that will be discussed throughout the three webinars. Uh, it seems a long time ago now that we ran consultations with uh, three cities in Pakistan in 2017, uh, that we hosted uh, a region-wide uh, workshop in Kolkata in 2018, and I can see a number of faces who were with us then, uh, and that we worked uh, with uh, three member cities in Bangladesh across 2019 and 2020, including also having done uh, assessments with um, uh, stakeholders in the Maldives. Uh, and just so that we uh, ensure that nobody feels left out, we also have had strong Sri Lankan participation 
uh, at those events, including the Kolkata workshop. So it's been a region wide affair and I'm, I'm delighted that we can look at how local stakeholders can really cooperate across the region through this. Um, this is an important session at this time. Uh, as we see the threat diversify and become really hybridized, we see extremism mix with disinformation, hate and polarization exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, and it's really important that we understand um, uh, this threat profile uh, for what it is uh, and don't narrow our vision and understanding of how we understand the threats across the region, how they manifest across national borders uh, and how they uh, bear similarities, but also differ from local context, from one local context to another. Uh, before we get going, uh, I would just like to, uh, if I may, uh, say a few words of um, housekeeping. May I ask all speakers, please, to do your best to keep to time. Uh, I apologize uh, at the outset for the fast paced nature of this event. Uh, but uh, if we can all keep uh, to our time slots, then it does enable us to have a few questions uh, uh, at the end of our panel discussions. Um, I also encourage all speakers, please, to reply to the, to the chat function where participants can ask questions directly to speakers and to the wider group. So in case your question is not uh, addressed uh, in the discussion, please do feel free to post it in the chat box. And I encourage speakers to keep a close eye uh, on that. Uh, finally, I, I just ask everybody as much as they can uh, to remain through to the end of this event. And we appreciate, of course, that you may have other engagements, uh, but uh, as much as you can, uh, staying to the end will allow us to address as many of the questions as we possibly can in today's session. Today's uh, session, as I said, will consist of, of, of two panels. Uh, and before we get there, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our keynote speaker, who I think will uh, helpfully set the tone uh, for today's uh, discussion. Uh, Mr. Monir Al Islam is uh, Additional Inspector General and the head of the Special Branch in the Bangladesh Police. Monir Al Islam led the response to one of the most prolific terror attacks in South Asia in recent years, when five militants took hostages and opened fire on the Holy Artisan Bakery in Dhaka five years ago in 2016. Uh, I know uh, very much that he bears a huge amount of professional experience uh, and we're delighted to have him uh, contribute his thoughts to this as he has been indeed shaping the thoughts of practitioners and policymakers alike across the region and how we respond to these uh, complex and increasingly hybridized challenges. So without further ado, Munir al-Islam, the floor is yours. Thank you. Monir, if you're just able to unmute yourself, uh, fantastic. Yes. The floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here as a uh, speaker. Uh, well, a group of uh, five missing youth, youths aged between uh, 19 uh, to uh, 26 of whom all were uh, students stormed into the Holy Artisan Bakery an upscale uh, restaurant of the capital's diplomatic enclave in the evening on uh, 2016 in uh, July uh, past. The terrorists carried uh, firearms, IDs, explosives, and machetes and knives. It was a 20, uh, it was a 12 hour seizure that killed uh, 20 hostages, including Italian, Japanese, uh, Indian, and American nationals, as well as Bangladeshi citizens. All of them were brutally hacked, slaughtered, uh, and two police officers were uh, killed, and several police officers were injured as well. It, uh, the, it was an infamous day for Bangladesh because Bangladesh had, has never experienced such brutal attacks in the past few years, uh, more specifically uh, since its independence. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge shock uh, for the nation. 
So uh, the investigation began after the uh, incident. Uh, after 12 hours, uh, in the next morning, a joint operation led by uh, uh, military commandos uh, was uh, that killed uh, that uh, uh, that killed five terrorists who entered into the uh, into the restaurant uh, in the previous evening. Um, and uh, several his hostages were uh, uh, rescued from that uh, from that restaurant. They were alive. Uh, the five perpetrators, uh, every every one was uh, very young. And uh, after the investigation, we found that uh, twenty one uh, terror suspects were involved in the whole planning and uh, execution. And of them, uh, 13, uh, 13 of them were uh, killed in different city operations. And uh, after investigation, uh, eight were suscited. And uh, in the final verdict, the court awarded death sentence to seven uh, terrorists. Uh, now they are waiting uh, for uh, death uh, sentence execution. The, um, in, uh, during the investigation, we uh, found uh, we tried to understand why they choose uh, a holy artisan as their uh, a target of attack uh, because it was uh, they, their target was to attack in diplomatic area uh, and they wanted to kill maximum foreign nationals uh, they knew that um, uh, foreign maximum foreign nationals gather in the restaurant every day in the afternoon so they choose it and uh, they wanted to get national and international media coverage uh, and uh, they wanted to draw uh, attention of uh, global uh, terrorist outfits uh, after the incident uh, the honorable prime minister uh, reiterated her zero tolerance policy against uh, terrorism and uh, he uh, she instructed all uh, uh, security agencies to uh, to uh, identify mm -hmm. and to bring uh, those culprits uh, to books. At the same time, she uh, invite she requested uh, the citizens of Bangladesh to uh, to uh, uh, to stand against unitedly against uh, terrorism. And uh, uh, accordingly, uh, security agencies conducted. Uh, uh, at least uh, 25 uh, to 26 high risk operations uh, which killed 75 terrorists in uh, after the incident in few months and of them uh, out of 26 uh, 13 were led by myself as the chief of counterterrorism and transnational crime uh, and uh, we succeeded in preventing further attacks after uh, holy artisan uh, bakery uh, after uh, and uh, uh, according uh, to our government policy, we had to take a, a, a smart counterterrorism policy, uh, combining both hard and soft approach. Uh, apart from hard approach, we also uh, I, 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 we had to identify the areas of intervention and improvement uh, for uh, 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 improvement to uh, uh, formulate. Uh, a pragmatic action plan for creating long-standing resilience against terrorism. Uh, so we prepared an action uh, plan, which uh, the first uh, which ha uh, had several pillars. The first pillar focuses on social resilience, um, uh, and uh, whereas the second pillar highlights developing a knowledge base and an intellectual foundation against the extremist ideologies. The third pillar was to uh, emphasize the need for intelligence and investigation to detect and prosecute violent extremist offenders. And finally, the fourth pillar envisions engagement with various stakeholders to stop radicalization uh, at different stages of life and uh, living. Uh, and uh, Bangladesh experienced the highest number of, uh, although Bangladesh experienced highest number of uh, terrorist act of terrorism in 2016, both in attack and casualty. However, Bangladesh succeeded to contain terrorism and to prevent the repetition of terrorist attacks. As a result, Bangladesh has shown uh, its uh, consistent success in combating terrorism in the last four, five consecutive, uh, consecutive years, which is clearly evident in Global Terrorism Index. If we uh, go through the index, 
uh, in South Asian countries, within seven uh, South Asian countries, uh, Bangladesh is uh, uh, the fifth uh, safer country because uh, before Bangladesh, uh, Nepal and Bhutan stand before Bangladesh. So this is our counterterrorism uh, su uh, success successes, and uh, the key takeaways uh, we uh, get from that uh, in the last five years during our uh, uh, relentless efforts uh, to uh, counter uh, countering terrorism and extremism. Uh, now we can understand that youths are always vulnerable to radicalization. If we uh, analyze the incidents in last uh, few years, who, those who were uh, involved in terrorist, terrorist activities and those who were killed or detained, most of them are youths. Uh, their age ranges from 17 to uh, 35. Uh, so, uh, and most of them were students. So, so youths are always vulnerable to radicalization. Then uh, only a few can, da uh, uh, can uh, damage hugely as only five uh, terrorists with uh, very uh, non-factory made weapons, they uh, created the havoc. Uh, and uh, the loss we, we had to uh, experience it, it still, it is, uh, we are facing the uh, loss. We are trying to make up the losses. So uh, the, the weapons and uh, the uh, number of people is uh, not, uh, I think it is the main, uh, main uh, factors, but their intention. Intention is the main factors. Uh, and uh, it didn't require uh, mass resources. Uh, because it uh, took uh, it, uh, we uh, during investigation we uh, estimated uh, the uh, cost of uh, probable costs of this uh, uh, terrorist activities, which uh, it, uh, carried which was carried out in holy artisan bakery. It was uh, more or less uh, ten uh, uh, ten thousand US dollar. So if we, uh, they do not require huge funds. Uh, even most secure daily area like uh, it, the, the Holy Artisan Bakery attack showed that even the most secure area like Kulshan was not safe enough because uh, we had a, a bit of intelligence that uh, there may be, there might be an attack on uh, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, diplo, uh, uh, embassy or diplomats. So we prepared and uh, we secured the place, but uh, the restaurant which they, target, they targeted was, uh, it was a very soft target and we didn't, it was, uh, it was lack of our imagination that a soft uh, target like restaurant can be uh, attacked. Uh, so, because it was unprecedented in Bangladesh, so uh, 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 so the uh, uh, prior intelligence, that is preemptive intelligence, is essential to uh, prevent uh, terrorist attacks. And uh, uh, the five terrorists who uh, carried out the attack, they had been missing for several months before before the attack. So we should not uh, ignore missing persons. Rather, rather uh, we should uh, uh, look uh, into those missing persons and try to uh, uh, find out them. Uh, and uh, explosives, uh, they used uh, only locally made, uh, uh, house-made explosives. Uh, they, that was not the grenades or bombs which were used. They were not military threat. Um, and it, it showed that it is very, uh, very difficult to handle those who uh, are ready to die. Because those five terrorists, they, in, they knew that they may, might not be able to escape from the restaurant, but still they did it. So uh, the, uh, those who are willing to die, it is very difficult to, uh, uh, to stop them. And uh, uh, lack of intelligence sharing uh, sometimes may cost because we have uh, had pieces of intelligence uh, in, uh, 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 that was gathered by different agencies, but uh, we could not uh, coordinate it. We cannot combine it 
uh, we could not combine it. So uh, uh, sharing intelligence and uh, lack of coordination sometimes uh, it may be fatal uh, uh, for 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 the city users, for law enforcing agencies, for security agencies. Um, so these were the key takeaways of uh, holy artisan attack in last five years. And now uh, after 20 in Bangladesh, we are uh, comparatively, uh, we are safer uh, in comparison to uh, in uh, comparison to many uh, countries, uh, not only in South Asia, but in the world, because in last uh, three years, there were not a single terrorist incident which killed uh, any, anyone. So uh, rather, we uh, conducted many uh, preemptive uh, operations, counterterrorism operations, and apprehended uh, uh, those uh, terrorist suspects who were preparing uh, to uh, mount uh, next attack. So this is uh, these are the uh, success of uh, I think Bangladeshi security agencies uh, uh, and uh, our counterterrorism uh, success is now considered as the uh, role model uh, in uh, not only in South Asia but in uh, many countries. Bangladesh is safer uh, than uh, in um, than uh, particularly Dhaka is safer than many. Uh, cities of the even uh, 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 better than, uh, safer than uh, Western uh, cities. Uh, but uh, uh, we understand that uh, the terrorism is a global phenomenon. And anytime, uh, if they get opportunity, they are, are willing person, they, but they don't have the opportunity when they get, when they get, when uh, we don't know whether they will get the, uh, uh, favorable atmosphere anywhere or any lacking on the part of the uh, intelligence agency, security agency, they uh, may uh, uh, prepare themselves again, they may reorganize again and uh, mount attack in the future. So we now we, uh, we uh, have several uh, dedicated counterterrorism agencies in Bangladesh and uh, uh, they have now better knowledge, better experience, better training, better equipment. So we are now confident uh, and we are uh, optimistic, uh, optimistic that uh, they, there is no, uh, there is a slim possibility of uh, further uh, rise of terrorism in Bangladesh, but we should not be complacent. So we are uh, extra vigilant. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, for uh, giving me time and your patience with these uh, few words. I thank you all. Munir al Islam, thank you so much um, for your time this morning, or this afternoon rather, uh, uh, and for sharing your insight and these important lessons, um, which I think we all bear, you know, very much at the forefront of our, our minds. It was great to hear uh, about the four pillars of the uh, National Action Plan and Strategy, which I think is really essential. Uh, I, uh, in particular, the fourth that emphasized engagement with multiple stakeholders, I think is so relevant for our discussion today. Uh, and just before I introduce the chair of our next panel, I just wanted to um, uh, point out that uh, we, after our UN session uh, earlier this year, uh, put together a sort of why cities matter uh, document, which is available. My colleagues will share that uh, link in, in, in the chat uh, shortly. Um, uh, but it really emphasizes the role that local governments can increasingly play uh, 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 as partners in this approach, really on the preventive um, uh, side of the equation. Uh, and although they often lack the mandates and uh, authorities from national government to be able to intervene in a more meaningful way, uh, they are, of course, the arbiters, if you like, of day-to-day -day public services at the local level, they engage with communities, they understand the dynamics. Uh, and indeed, you know, as we see uh, issues like good governance um, and trust in institutions become so important <clears throat> for wider societal resilience, uh, you know, they, they hold a lot of influence over uh, how that can be um, manifest at the local levels and improve our, our resilience. Uh, across communities. And we've seen that through the research and engagement of our stakeholders across the world. That's not just in, in Bangladesh or just in South Asia, of course, that's 
uh, worldwide. So uh, it's a really helpful document. Manuel Islam, thank you so much once again for your time. Um, I think you, you have given us a huge amount uh, uh, to get stuck into. And I think it's now important that we turn to our first panel discussion. And as we look uh, and zoom out of, of Bangladesh and look at the region uh, uh, writ large um, and look perhaps mm -hmm. at the threat landscape, what's changed perhaps since 2016 and the Holy Artisan attack uh, uh, and what we need to be doing about it going forward. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the chair for uh, our panel, uh, Malika Joseph. Uh, a great friend of Strong Cities Network. She was with us in 2018, I know, in Kolkata, uh, and uh, so grateful to have her back uh, with us today. Uh, Malika is Senior Fellow uh, at Women in Security, Conflict Management and Peace, uh, and she's Visiting Fellow at the Centre for Policy Research in New Delhi. Uh, until 2020, she served as Policy Advisor and Regional Coordinator for the Asia Pacific at the Hague-based Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict. So Malika, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Daniel. It's, it's been a pleasure to be part of uh, the network uh, and looking at violent uh, extremism in particular and how it's uh, evolved and how it is being uh, mitigated and addressed in the region. So before we jump directly into uh, violent extremism, on the subject of violent extremism, I just wanted to flag larger trends that have been happening across the globe which has an impact on how uh, violent ex extremism is uh, um, being felt in the region. Uh, one, of course, is the uh, entire aspect of uh, democratic declining and shrinking civic space, which is happening all over the world, but more so particularly in this region. Uh, most of the democratic indices have flagged South Asia as a region of concern with many countries uh, in the region having declined uh, sharply and added to um, you know, the, 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 the shrinking of civic space. And why this is important is because that's one of the trigger points for extremism itself. Uh, the second, of course, is the uh, entire demography of Asia, particularly South Asia vis-a-vis -vis the other countries, which is, uh, and we are likely to see a large movement of people uh, across the globe, but more so from South Asia to the rest of the world. And where people go, so do their politics. And uh, what influences they have in the host country, in the countries, and what they bring back to the region. I think those are like larger trends we need to look at. The third is, of course, uh, the pandemic itself and how that has had an impact and how it's accentuated some of these uh, fissures that were pre-existing uh, in the region, uh, which uh, gives space for uh, extremist tendencies itself. But above all of that, there is good news though, that we have global frameworks which are more in place right now. We have the sustainable development goals, which is now more moved from a department engagement within the government to all of government, all of government owned uh, process. And why I flag this is important is because it drives and asks states for inclusive governance and it tries to address inequality. So we have some of these larger trends that are happening uh, within, the, uh, within the world and in the region. And then specifically, I think now in today's session, we will focus more uh, on how within that context, how is, um, how is um, uh, at the region, how are we experiencing uh, violent extremism? And for that, we have some, um, we have about four fantastic um, outstanding experts with us today who will be addressing four key points or four key questions of the session itself. Uh, one is like, what are the most uh, pressing threats and challenges that South Asia is facing due to violent extremism in the region? And how is that, what is happening in the region? How is it being felt uh, locally at the national level and at the local levels? And what are communities and states doing in response to those emerging threats? And how can they actually also respond better so these are the four questions that uh, we will be discussing today. And we have uh, four experts, as I mentioned. We have uh, Dr. Faiz Soban from uh, Bangladesh. We have uh, Dr. Mubin from India and Dr. Uh, Minas from Pakistan and Dr. Azim uh, from uh, the Maldives. So uh, first I'd like to introduce, uh, briefly to introduce um, Faiz, um, a good friend. Uh, he's currently the Senior Research Director at the DEI which is based in Dhaka and it has been doing the Institute and affairs have been doing some outstanding work 
on uh, counterterrorism and particularly on the threat to uh, extremism and terrorism itself on South Asia today. Uh, so Fez, uh, on to you. And before uh, Fez, you start uh, each speaker, you have about six to seven minutes maximum. And I'll give you um, a kind of a signal when we are crossed, uh, when you've crossed six minutes. And those of you who have questions, please post it on the chat box because we may not have an ext extensive, extensive Q&A session immediately after the session. Uh, Fez, over to you. Fez, we can't hear you. No, no, you're not audible. Okay, why don't you try to rejoin? Uh, meanwhile, could I ask, um, uh, Mubin to probably uh, take the floor, please. And uh, briefly to introduce Mubin, she's a senior faculty at the University of Delhi. She's an award-winning writer and has been awarded the UN-sponsored uh, media award uh, twice for her writings on gender sensitization. She's also authored several uh, books. Her, ex her expertise, expertise includes history, gender, and CV. Um, Mubin? Could we have you please? I'm sorry, can you hear oh, yeah. me now? Yes, 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 we can, we can. Fez. May I carry on? Yes, please. Okay, apologies uh, for that. Uh, Zoom is full of a number of little problems. Uh, Malika, thanks so much. Wonderful to see you after so very long. Um, you talked about the broad trends. Now let me sort of zero in if you like on uh, you know how these uh, how the threat of extremism alone affects us in the region. So of course, we all know that ISIS has lost their caliphate, but obviously their ideology remains and still resonates with uh, thousands, not just in the region, but beyond. But I think it goes without saying that the first and foremost uh, uh, thought on our mind vis-a-vis -vis the problem of extremism has been uh, undoubtedly the return of the Taliban in Afghanistan. I think it has uh, sent shockwaves across the region, including, of course, in Bangladesh. Everyone is quite worried, and rightly so, uh, because countries in the region may well see the resulting consequences play out in their respective countries. And uh, the danger in South Asia is that we have the tentacles of both ISIS as well as Al Qaeda going back, you know, the last uh, five, six years at least. Um, and I think the return of the Taliban has obviously, we've seen ISIS K increase their activities, including a few attacks against the Taliban and also the, the uh, very tragic attack at the airport when the Americans were trying to leave. Uh, so I think my fear is that we'll see an increased competition between Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS. And of course, that bodes uh, very badly for not just Afghanistan, but its uh, neighborhood as well. So uh, coupled with that, you have the absence of Western forces and their allies to focus on this particular uh, security threat and um, uh, you know, it gives the space to groups, extremist groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda to, uh, if you like, grow unabated and flourish. Um, and I think, uh, obviously, the, the world or the cyber world of uh, online extremism uh, is still a major concern to governments everywhere, uh, including ours. Uh, because the volume of material is absolutely staggering. Uh, I'm not an expert uh, on, um, you know, if you like, on the technical side of extremism, uh, but from whatever I can view on the surface and a bit on the deep web, it's very, very alarming, very, very worrying, the amount of material that's put out on a daily basis, uh, you know, all kinds of literature, videos, etc. And of course, even if there are no new videos or material, they keep churning out old stuff, uh, you know, including 
Bangladeshi fighters uh, in Afghanistan who have uh, thereafter been killed, uh, apprehended. Uh, so that, that's another worry. But uh, now going down to the point about how uh, it may play out at the local level, as I mentioned, you know, the, the uh, if you like, ISIS and Al-Qaeda, the way they inspire and influence groups and their connections to a number of local groups, including in Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, of course, we have uh, two major extremist groups, Neo-GMB, who are behind the holy attack and a string of other attacks. And they, they would like to portray themselves as the local ISIS chapter or uh, brand these as ISIS attacks. We don't know how deep these linkages were, uh, although we have officially 40 or so Bangladeshis who did go and join ISIS, most have been killed. Uh, but of course, there's also been an interest by uh, Bangladeshi nationals to join uh, the Taliban, and uh, as well as other groups, including Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Uh, earlier this year, um, uh, there were allegedly reports of uh, a group of 10 individuals who tried to make their way to Afghanistan, two made it, four were apprehended. So, you know, that obviously uh, set off alarm bells. And this is, mind you, earlier in the year. So we don't know what exactly has uh, sort of uh, transpired uh, after the Taliban's takeover. So we need to keep our eyes um, you know, um, open about uh, that particular type of threat, because obviously some of these individuals who make it out there may try and come back and uh, you know, cause attacks here, or at least uh, attempt to, uh, uh, to undertake activities here. Uh, but our, our um, law enforcement authorities are quite vigilant in that regard. Uh, the very two or three individuals who have managed to make it back from Syria have been apprehended and have been charged. Um, so uh, that is certainly uh, something that impacts us at the local level. Implications for local communities and cities? Uh, well, the, there's obviously, uh, as I mentioned, the, the links of the two um, you know, uh, global brand uh, jihadi groups, uh, ISIS and Al Qaeda to local groups. And, uh, you know, it obviously increases the challenge of uh, uh, municipalities, of uh, local communities, obviously, cities uh, writ large. In Dhaka, you have the, you have two major city corporations, as many of you will know about. Uh, uh, Dhaka North and Dhaka South. So of course we we know very well that city corporations are geared towards delivering services to the people. That's their overarching objective, if you like. But you know, as the Strong Cities Network has shown um, in uh, and from the work done by other cities, that uh, local cities, uh, local governments do have a role to play in if you like keeping citizens safe in uh, not just uh, making the city more livable, but making it obviously more safe. It's not primarily a task uh, which should be applied just to the police. Uh, city authorities do have a specific role in that regard. Uh, you know, so in this case, uh, the city corporations of Dhaka North and Dhaka South. And I think in terms of, uh, activities, it's it's essential to develop community. And, uh, last minute, Fez. Okay, I'll wrap up. Uh, so uh, to just to sum up community engagement programs to build uh, resilient social uh, cohesion, I think is essential. There are groups out there who are still trying to drive a wedge between our various ethnic and religious groups. Uh, we've seen this play out this year and in previous years. And uh, I think the, both the city corporations need to, um, if you like, join hands with, uh, with uh, other relevant agencies and experts because they can't do this on, alone on the issue of PCV. And I think that goes down to dealing with 
the problem at the grassroots level, so i.e. communities, families. I think uh, there needs to be a, um, a mechanism to uh, strengthen trust and confidence, including having a platform, if you like, to openly discuss and uh, share uh, views and concerns at the community level, at the grassroots level. Um, so I would like to end on that note, but happy to answer any questions uh, anyone may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Fez. And uh, uh, others who have a question for Fez, if you could just post it on the chat box, uh, we will have an opportunity to come back uh, to that. And with that, we move on to uh, Mubin. And uh, Mubin, you have six minutes. I know the kind of expertise that all of you have. It'll be difficult to shrink in within about six to seven minutes, uh, but I'm uh, seriously asking you to do so, so that we could have some level of discussion. Uh, yeah. Yes, Mubin, over yeah. to you. Yeah, thank you, Malika. It's the most difficult job uh, to ask a, a faculty of a university to talk only for six minutes because we can go on and on and on. And our usually our classes are for two hours and we don't stop. We continuously talk for two hours. Now, having said that, let me try to, uh, you know, incorporate my ideas and my contribution here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank SCN team for um, inviting and giving me this platform. And uh, um, uh, keeping into consideration the three points or the three or four points that uh, Malika has mentioned that we have to uh, incorporate our discussion within those themes, I uh, have uh, decided uh, to start uh, with uh, the concept of, uh, I think that is what uh, uh, SCN also works on the importance of uh, local uh, uh, intervention and contribution. So uh, I would like to, uh, you know, mention here that the epitome of uh, nonviolence, Mahatma Gandhi, his belief and his uh, uh, most important thought uh, was that uh, the ideas about preventing violence, it went far beyond involving uh, you know, he, he believed in involving social institutions and public priorities, as well as individual beliefs and communities. You know, when I, uh, when I mentioned Mahatma Gandhi, uh, he uh, pressing on the issue of individual beliefs and communities, then I come to the threat that we are facing. The threat that we are facing is quite apparent, but we all choose to be politically correct and not uh, accept those threats. Being a historian, I would also want uh, to, you know, uh, kind of uh, take you to the politics of Islamic extremist ideology. I'll just share a short uh, incident that happened with me when I visited um, uh, USA. There was a mosque, there was an Islamic center I visited in Huntsville. And I, I the imam, uh, you know, uh, first of all, one of my friend was not allowed to enter. And then, uh, you know, she was secluded out and she had to follow certain restrictions. So but anyway, when we have an in, when we had an informal meeting, I asked the imam that I'm really, uh, I'm really astonished that there's so much of effort that is being done on your part, but still, why is it that there's only one religion that is associated with terrorism and extremism? So uh, he didn't answer my question, but I had many of my fellow friends from different parts of the world who got quite angry on me asking that question. So I think it's important that we start with asking difficult questions with the people who are involved in this, right? Now, having said that, uh, you know, the problem is with the extremist ideology. And we all know, we whoever is present here are quite known to the fact that the extremist ideology is related to political interest. The main problem is that my friend was just mentioning about ISIS and about the Daesh and about these extremist groups. Now, friends tell me uh, they want to go back to the glorious past of Islam. In what sense and in what what sense does it make in history to go to the past? It does it. It goes against the law of nature. What is the glorious past? Those so, my friends, the glorious past is where you can, when you can victimize the women. You can find easy sex slaves in women. You can just 
ruin the cities go to iraq go to syria go to yemen go to these places and see what kind of a uh, glorious past these extremist uh, groups are trying to bring back is it not known to anybody everybody knows what is this glorious past so i don't understand what is this glorious past or the uh, glorious past of islam that these agencies are trying to bring back next having said that a state cannot be religious this is the biggest problem and it is quite apparent especially in our area also it's right sitting on over our head is taliban how can a state be religious you know how can you have politics state along with religion that is the problem when you amalgamate state and religion that is where the problem starts hence if we try to amalgamate religion with state we will have problem now i can only say that it's a well known fact that these extremist groups are a self destructive ideological groups and my friends the political scenario are well aware of it the social scenario are well aware of it now coming to the economic threat are we not aware of the narco terrorism that taliban is promoting a large part of ungoverned space a mammoth illicit economy is it not a local uh, local issue why is it not a local issue why is not anybody talking about it why is not anyone trying to tackle this it's not just a political issue it's an economic issue also right now there is a there is a now having said that i'll just uh, try to uh, you know um, kind of uh, talk about the threats uh now see uh there is also i spoke about economic narco terrorism i spoke about uh, the, the the glorious past that our extremist people are trying to bring back because it's not about getting back to islam or sharia or these laws right what is divine about it i just don't understand what is so divine about it oppression oppression of women oppression of children killing of innocent people what is this is this a divine law and why is the entire uh, uh, you know muslim uh, political community quiet on it why are they quiet why are these voices not being heard against atrocities being committed in these region my question is that right then one more thing that i want to put forth rightfully uh, is moving that. one more minute okay okay yeah fine i conclude i just conclude by uh, one of the quotations of uh, you know uh, i think ban ki moon he says that the world is overarmed and peace is underfunded i think it's absolutely right right now just two very quick points uh, malika if you just allow me my concern is the religious political intermingling we need more regimes the so called democratic islamic regimes are also not democracy like malika said in her opening remarks we have to see to the strengthening of democracy and there is a kind of a farce also being created by some regimes who believe and who say that they are islamic and they are i don't know which islam they are following i am not a religious expert my friends here who are they could throw light that the prophet would never kill any innocent uh, child or any innocent women or any innocent uh, human life so which islam they are following and why is it that it's being promoted so this is the big question and also cross border terrorism state sponsored terrorism so these are the questions which have to be tackled head on and the responsibility of the religious people grows every friday you you can give sermons see these you can give sermons where you can uh, my munirul hasan saab he was talking about uh, the way bangladesh is handling i think it's amazing so why not these people are coming out with this solution because they are, they know the problem but it suits it's politically suits them so yeah i think i rest my case there yeah so we need to take it on head on thank you thank you malika thank you thank you uh, mubin um, uh, i do questions understand questions are invited yeah i do understand it's a challenge to finish within that uh, short uh, time too uh, bigger challenge we now move to uh, dr minas uh, majid khan who's an assistant professor uh, in uh, the university of uh, peshawar and she specializes on gender peace security as well as uh, countering violent terrorism 
um, in uh, and con conflict resolution and politics of uh, South Asia. Uh, given that both the earlier speakers also touched about what's happening in Afghanistan and how that's going to shape a violent extremism in South Asia, we eagerly look forward to what our next speaker has to say. Uh, Dr. Minas, uh, the floor is yours. About uh, six minutes, please. Uh, you are being muted, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Malika, uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to such an August uh, gathering. Uh, well, uh, talking about countering, first of all, I always, you know, uh, when I talk to my students or in uh, to organization who are trying to, uh, you know, counter violent voices or extremism, I also uh, always tell them to, you know, make an effort to prevent uh, violent extremism and then think about uh, uh, countering them. So uh, I'll be uh, focusing, uh, talking about countering violent extremism in South Asia and focusing more on uh, religious uh, aspect of uh, uh, violence in South Asia. Because uh, the phenomenon of violence uh, with its changing nature and dynamics has become a challenge uh, requiring utmost attention. Historically, the use of violence for the pursuit of vested interests was uh, most often uh, used for political motivated aims and ideological objectives of the extremist groups. Now, the South Asian region currently faces uh, grave security threats due to increasing extremism and ex uh, terrorist activities. Uh, and the politics of violence and extremist trends in South Asia can be linked to the contradictions uh, arising as a consequence of faulty national policies. And I'm not talking about one or two or uh, three states. It's uh, very common in almost all the South Asian countries, with the exception of Afghanistan, where we see no political stability or, or no government in a position to uh, counter such uh, tendencies. Then uh, South Asia is among the regions in the world with the highest annual number of fatalities caused by um, violent uh, extremism or terrorist violence, uh, ethnic uh, if uh, we can say ideological and political conflicts uh, also pose a serious threat to stability and interstate relations. And each state faces multiple concerns ranging from fundamentalists to ethno-political violence, which are consolidating along with the worsening socioeconomic conditions. Now, in an era of globalization, fundamentalism, or to be more specific, extremism of all shades has kept hostage uh, not only our region, but the whole world. Tolerance is eroding due to fundamentalism in countries where clergy have the support of political elites uh, for their vested interest. Political violence is associated with far right and ethnically and racially motivated extremism is uh, also a growing threat around the uh, South Asia. Uh, many quarters, uh, when they engage in such kind of uh, discussion, they argue that religion is the sole motive behind uh, violent extremism. Uh, but there are others, uh, other factors that include poverty, economic disparity, illiteracy, political deprivation, and pressure also uh, as uh, are uh, some uh, contributing factors. I'll quote William T. Kavanaugh here, who identified two groups. One that believes that the motivation behind so-called religious violence is in fact economic and political and not religious. And the other claims that people who do violence are by definition not religious. Now, this is very important because whenever, uh, as uh, some of my colleagues just mentioned, uh, some of the uh, non-state actors like uh, ISIS and uh, Taliban and for that matter, Al-Qaeda as well, uh, they are using the name of religion or there are so many other, you know, religious groups 
uh, within South Asia belonging to different countries like Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, they are using religion, but uh, we are not even sure whether they are, uh, you know, by definition, as religious as they are portraying to be. So can we say that religious identity is taking over uh, class or ethnic identity? And uh, a key point uh, is when religion and political identities are overlapped, the followers of a religion uh, tend to take a number of political actions. Firstly, uh, they uh, try to inject their uh, religious values and laws into the laws of the country. Secondly, certain individuals may also wish to politically support the causes of their co-religionist living in other countries or regions. And political conflicts can also grow into religious conflicts and religious conflicts into political conflicts. So if we see the situation in South Asia, Sri Lanka, uh, where the Sinhalese Buddhist majority chose a hard and an extremist Tamil response. Bangladesh, um, where uh, an existing Islamic uh, um, uh, movement gained strength and political parties gave into uh, hifajat islam demands. Uh, and then in Afghanistan, Pakistan, along with Saudi Arabia and United States, supported the rise of Mujahideen, which fast-tracked the struggle against Soviet occupation in Afghanistan. About Pakistan, I would say that some scholars, um, uh, I mean, they claim that since inception, Islam uh, was the cementing force creating the national identity of Pakistan, which otherwise stand, stand uh, divided along ethnic, provincial, cultural, religious, class, and linguistic lines. Later on in 70s, General Zaira is criticized for his policies of supporting violent voices. So the main effect uh, of globalization or the positive effect of globalization is that uh, the people become aware of divergent values, ethics, cultures, and societies. But when is that going to happen? So. Uh, if we may say that uh, diverse, uh, diverse society is one that accepts uh, people from all social, cultural, and linguistic, uh, racial, ethnic, political, religious backgrounds, and uh, it leads to um, a life where people live uh, the regional countries, we find that uh, almost all the countries um, have adopted uh, policies of countering violent extremism. Uh, they try to identify okay. violent. Last minute, please. Yes, I'll wrap it up. Uh, just a few seconds more, please. So uh, by identifying uh, extremist ideologies and introducing de-radicalization programs at various levels in almost all uh, countries. I think SARC is uh, one platform where we can cooperate, all the regional countries can cooperate since uh, we most often talk about regional integration, but it should not be economic uh, regional integration, but politically as well so that uh, all the countries uh, you know, can uh, counter violent voices and violent extremism. And that needs states to review their uh, respective policies of preventing or countering violent extremism. Because as I said earlier, laws exist everywhere in each country, but are rarely implemented. The, um, so uh, what do we need to do? We need resilience, uh, cohesion, uh, debate, dialogue, and above all, all democratic pluralism, in the regional states and within states among all the stakeholders. So uh, religious extremism or violent extremism of all shade, I think should be first uh, addressed at local level in local perspective, and then at regional level in regional perspective uh, between and among all the states of South Asia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Menas, uh, for that. Uh, we'll now move to our uh, last uh, speaker, Dr. Azim uh, Zahir, who's a, a research fellow from the University of uh, Western uh, Australia. 
Um, you have about uh, six minutes, uh, Dr. Azim. Okay, thank you. Um, do you see my slides? All good? Yes, we can. Yeah, we can. You need to put it on presentation mode. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak uh, at this very important uh, panel, I believe. And uh, thank you all speakers. I've learned quite a lot from you, uh, the regional uh, dynamics in violent extremism. Uh, I know that uh, we've got only six minutes, so I've got about six or eight slides. I'll, I'll try to be very quick and run through them. But if you have any questions, uh, if, if anything is not clear, I'm happy to answer uh, the questions. Uh, the quick outline is I'll very quickly run you through um, the current violent extremism situation focusing in the Maldives and uh, talk a little bit about the key threats and challenges the Maldives faces and the regional linkages Maldivian uh, violent extremists have. And then um, in, in terms of responding to violent extremism, uh, the PCVE landscape in the Maldives. Now, uh, some of you might be aware that the very first terrorism related uh, attack in the Maldives took place in 2007. Um, 12 foreign tourists were injured. The attack uh, using an IED uh, took place in the main uh, public park in the capital city, which is Male, uh, which was in 2007. And several people were arrested. And we know that these people had uh, links to Al Qaeda and luxury Taiba in, in, in Pakistan. Since then, there was no major completed terrorist attack in the Maldives. There were several uh, plots, very serious plots, some related to ISIS, but also um, uh, targeted assassinations. At least four people have been murdered, uh, which, which are believed to be linked to violent extremists in Maldives. But um, if you look at 2020, there was a sharp uptick in terrorism related attacks in the Maldives. There were at least four completed attacks in the country. Uh, one of them was a stabbing attack of three foreign nationals in Hulmale Island, which is also part of the capital city linked uh, with, with, through a bridge. But there was also a very serious arson attack uh, in one of the islands, Mahibadu Island, uh, where the target was gov mainly government vessels. Now, um, well, why this uptick in 2020? Um, I, I would argue that the main reason for that was uh, since to mid-2019, uh, the authorities really uh, sort of um, raised uh, the counterterrorism activities and, and there were a lot of counterterrorism operations. And uh, that led to sort of tit for tat, uh, hardening of extremist ident identity. Uh, and, and, and most of these attacks are we know are revenge attacks. So that was the situation in 2020. So we knew that in 2020, there was a, an escalation in the threat level. Uh, and it was really not surprising, although it is very shocking that by far the, the most serious terrorist attack in the Maldives took place on 6 May, 2021, uh, which targeted uh, former president and current speaker of the parliament, Mohammed Nasheed. Uh, he nearly really narrowly survived that attack. It was a very, very serious uh, uh, bomb attack uh, using an IED in the busiest street in capital Mali. So that is 2021. And um, looking at that very quickly, um, we know that all the 2020 attacks uh, were uh, carried out by supporters of ISIS in Maldives. These people operate in small, uh, small cells uh, in, in, in island settings. Uh, there are small, cell, uh, small cells, especially in uh, some hotspot islands. These hotspot islands include urban areas like um, the Addu city, which is the southernmost uh, area in the Maldives, but also the capital city. Um, also looking at the groups in the Maldives, we know that ISIS supporters are the most active in terms of online propaganda. They use WhatsApp, uh, they use Telegram, and they use Viber, but also Facebook, uh, to some extent Twitter as well. And also we know that these groups have developed linkages with regional groups like ISIS KP, KPE and ISIS HP, uh, Hindu province. Uh, for example, there's a regular column by Maldivians to South of Hind, uh, the magazine uh, believed to be published by ISIS HP. Um, but um, prison radicalization is another major challenge uh, the Maldives has faced. There are at least 30 to 40 radicalized inmates in, 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 in the main prison who we know are trying to radicalize and recruit people um, into violent extremism. 
Uh, another major issue is um, foreign fighters, and, and, and which would help us understand the challenges uh, in the aftermath of the takeover uh, in Af Afghanistan by Taliban. We know that at least 169 Maldivians traveled, for example, Syria and Iraq, which makes Maldives one of the highest contributors to uh, per capita com contributors of foreign fighters uh, who went to Syria and Iraq. These include, unfortunately, children and, and women as well. As you can see from that bar chart, 22% uh, of them are women, and 24% of them are children, and 54% are men. Now, um, because a lot of Maldivians really went to Syria and Iraq, authorities are really concerned that uh, because of uh, what is happening in Afghanistan, that Maldivians, given the opportunity, might travel to Syria, so to Afghanistan and, and, and Pakistan, uh, that region. Uh, at least there was one Maldivian family who joined ISIS KP and they were in prison when Taliban took over. And we know that they have been released, but uh, they, we don't know their whereabouts. So that's a real concern uh, given if there is an opportunity, some Maldivians might really try to uh, join um, ISIS K or, 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 or Al Qaeda. Um, now, uh, but uh, if you look at the responses so far from, at least if you scan the online uh, uh, media, we know that there hasn't been much uh, propaganda in terms of recruiting Maldivians to go to Af Afghanistan. Several groups actually celebrated uh, the Taliban takeover, but we know that there hasn't been new campaigns to recruit people to go to Afghanistan uh, online, which is usually the case in the Maldives uh, in the past. Uh, very quickly looking at how to really respond to these threats. Now, um, the very quick overview shows that uh, violent extremism remains a serious security threat in the Maldives, but also uh, has become a real social problem. Uh, one of the main uh, problems, uh, gaps in, in terms of PCV or preventing and countering violent extremism in the Maldives is that there is no systematic secondary level intervention targeting people who are at risk of radicalization or people who show uh, signs of radicalization. So for example, if you look at the attack uh, targeting President Nasheed, we know that uh, one of the key suspects who is uh, at the moment arrested, uh, his family and his friends knew that he has been with a group. Please, last yeah, one minute. Very quick. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, so he was with a radical group for five years, his friends and family knew, but there was nowhere to turn to. But also another serious gap is that there is no uh, rehabilitation, disengage, disengagement or de-radicalization program in the Maldives. In prison, for example, there's nothing uh, in prison uh, in a systematic way. But also the existing PCB programs are very uh, limited, um, mainly focusing on prevention, you know, uh, trying to raise awareness, uh, uh, things like that. Another issue would be um, repatriation of 50 or so Maldivians stranded in Syria. Uh, most of them are women and children. The authorities are trying to re repatriate them and there's a new national reintegration center uh, uh, to accommodate these people and run uh, reintegration programs. Uh, one of the main challenges from my point of view would be uh, to address a negative perception uh, towards these people in, in the communities. Uh, there are also no mechanisms within communities to really receive these people once they have their rehabilitation, disengagement, or um, de-radicalization program. So that's some uh, an area that the authorities really need to focus on. Uh, another um, uh, area the authorities need to focus on, and even civil society groups could uh, help in here, would be community community based programs. Is very at the moment very centrally planned and driven. Uh, community groups need to take more ownership uh, and they need to be more empowered, I believe. So that's a very quick overview of the situation in the Maldives and some of the regional linkages. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Azim, as well as uh, thank you for all the panelists for uh, very quickly summing up uh, you know, your years of uh, experience and expertise on the subject. Uh, since we um, have almost run out of time, we won't be having an open Q&A session, but then I encourage uh, participants to uh, put in your questions that you will have for the panel in the chat box so that uh, panelists can continue to respond to them as we proceed with the session. Um, just to conclude this session, just uh, key points that uh, have come up uh, during the presentation, as well as uh, larger trends that continue to remain. Uh, number one, when we, are when we talk about addressing violent extremism, it still continues to be at a countering violent extremism rather than preventing violent extremism. I think that challenge still remains. And because of that, secondly, kinetic 
options are the one which are more uh, more use um, are more apparent ra rather than non kinetic ones point number 3 therefore it is more a state led engagement rather than a society led engagement when we are talking about uh, violent extremism and uh, point number 4 i think most uh, speakers here spoke about one version of violent extremism in the region which is islamic but uh, the other ones that south asia is unique to which is your um, hindu as well as the buddhist uh, extremism that we haven't had time to unpack uh, quite significantly here and number 5 it would be interesting to know how sdgs uh, have a positive impact or if at all they have any impact on um, addressing violent extremism and the last point the question that i also have in my mind is like many conflicts were impacted due to the pandemic so was there an equivalent impact on how violent extremism panned out in the region so these are like some of the points that i like to leave uh, the the, the uh, participants uh, with and uh, maybe we can pick up more of it uh, in the chat box uh, thank you daniel uh, for this uh, for providing the opportunity to the panelists and for me to provide our perspectives and set the tone for your 3 uh, day webinar and uh, over uh, over and back to you daniel malika thank you so much and and thank you to all of the distinguished speakers that we heard from in that first panel i think that was um an extremely helpful framing discussion um that took in of course of course perspectives across the region Um, Malika, I think that your summary and the questions that you pose there at the end um, provide a huge amount of food for thought. I I wish that we had uh, more time here to have that open discussion. Um, I I do implore everybody as much as possible. I know nobody quite likes these uh, 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 online platforms, but as much as possible to use the chat functions. Uh, and I hope that beyond that, we pick up those questions in future. um discussions i'd like to just underline one really important point that malika you were quite right to 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 point out which is that we've focused on a very narrow um form of uh, violence and violent extremism here in the in the discussion today and and the strong cities network um in across all of the regions of engagement actually look at the plurality uh, uh and all forms of violent extremism uh, and what we're doing is try to like, trying to identify the the learnings and lessons that can be taken from how to empower and advance the role of local stakeholders in addressing those across the spectrum so i think it's a really important point uh, and thanks everybody for that framing um discussion uh given time is where it is i'd like to move now on to uh, our second panel um uh, and i think this is a really important discussion the panel will address um the existing multilateral level interventions uh, across the region we'll have three speakers that will speak to those multilateral interventions vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, preventing and countering violent extremism uh, but specifically i would like to hone in on uh, how uh, cities and local governments can become uh, better and stronger and more useful partners uh, to the multilateral level and vice versa um i think often we look at multilateral interventions we think un we think government um and we think civil society uh all of which is fantastic but i think there is a missing link here in uh, uh utilizing the experience perspectives and understanding uh, of local governments uh, their day-to-day -day functions uh, that we've talked about throughout the session so far and how that can integrate with multilateral Uh, understandings and, and and frameworks so i think that's a really important um set of questions and and uh, to address those we have three again very distinguished speakers uh, uh representing perspectives across the region and i'd like to introduce uh, our first uh, speaker uh, marine uh, shabazian uh, who is with us um from gsef uh, marine has been working at the global global community engagement and resilience fund gsef since 2016 in different roles Uh, since 2020 she's assumed the role of a country manager for Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Kenya country programs. Uh, she's responsible for the overall uh, management of programs coordination with governments, uh, donors, uh, PVE stakeholders uh, and to uh, ensure that GCSF's programs are aligned with country uh, PCVE priorities uh, and add value to the existing efforts. So without further ado, Marine, uh, I invite you to uh, take the floor and uh, provide your Uh, comments and contributions marine the floor is yours
Thank you. Good afternoon. It's good to be here and to share this earth experience in South Asia. I hope you can see uh, my slides on the screen and I will just continue and uh, share some of the highlights from our experience in South Asia, specifically in Bangladesh. BISAC is a global fund dedicated to the prevention of violent extremism. We are working in 14 countries around the world, and we see our role in directing global, global funds into local hands. We do this by working with over 200 local partners, grassroots level organizations in different countries around the world, including in South Asia. In South Asia, we are present in Bangladesh since 2016. We have worked with over 50 local grassroots level organizations and currently we have two active consortia programs in Bangladesh uh, managed by Opentar and Young Power in Social Action. In Sri Lanka our program is very uh, young, we started the program a few months ago and therefore today I will speak mostly about our program in Bangladesh. Youth is in the heart of our programs. In Bangladesh, we support over 400 youth platforms at different levels in boards, in unions, and uh, city corporations. Young people from 18 to 35 have the opportunity to come together on a regular basis, learn different skills on uh, prevention of violent extremists, for example, early signs of radicalization, the role of youth in prevention of uh, violent extremism, leadership skills, community engagement skills. They have discussions and dialogues about respect for diversity, social cohesion, uh, tolerance, and peace. Young people supported to engage with community stakeholders such as local authorities, religious leaders, uh, teachers, journalists, and other stakeholders, and they are supported to uh, brainstorm, to come up with ideas on community level PD actions to lead and to implement those community level actions. So this study, which we have conducted a few months ago, involving 2,800 respondents, young people, local authorities, religious leaders, and other community stakeholders, revealed that the awareness of youth on the prevention of violent extremism is lower, 56% in urban areas, compared to 63% in rural areas. While um, the key stakeholders, such as local authorities, religious leaders, they support active youth involvement in PV issues on issues related to the prevention of violent extremism. At the same time, they accepted that there are limited opportunities for young people to participate in decision-making, as well as limited opportunities for stronger cohesion among different ethnic, religious, and cultural communities, especially in, in urban areas. I think uh, pictures themselves to address some of the challenges that they have mentioned and that were um, identified through the baseline study. Uh, the program supports young people to equip with relevant skills, to interact with local authorities, religious leaders, other stakeholders, and to initiate, lead, and implement specific PD actions such as knowledge, cultural, sport activities in their communities, in schools, educational institutions, dialogues and discussions with local authorities, religious leaders, trainings and um, different social activities with community members. For example, you can see on the photo that young people in Kuna, which is the third largest city in Bangladesh, they came with an idea to organize free um, primary health care healthcare screening and consultation for um, people living in, in one of the disadvantaged areas of the city. Uh, the work of uh, youth platforms has been um, appreciated and recognized in many places where those platforms uh, work. Specifically in uh, Kulna, the municipality invites from time to time representatives of youth platforms to join town hall meetings where young people have the opportunity to voice their concerns, to share their rec recommendations. They were also invited to join some um, uh, municipality um, uh, actions, for example, on vaccina vaccinations for COVID-19 uh, pandemic. In Rajahi as well, young people joined the municipality uh, planning meeting on urban development and both municipalities in Kuna and in Rajahi supported different actions initiated and implemented by uh, young people. Other good practices involve, for example, 
the young people uh, decided to come together and support a celebration and one of one of the um, annual uh, religious fest festivals during the time when there were um, intercommunal tension of the Bangladesh. Young people belonging to different communities, ethnic and religious communities, they came together, they supported our organization, those uh, festivals, and ensured that they are celebrated peacefully and with, with, um, with, uh, without any incidents. And I can mention that in the locations where youth platforms are active, uh, there were no incidents uh, observed, no tension, uh, intercommunal tension observed during those uh, periods. And um, based on our experience in Bangladesh, as well as uh, in other countries, we believe that uh, prevention activities are more effective when they are led and when they are owned by young people. Indeed, engagement with the local authorities, such as municipalities, um, uh, the different level authorities, as well as other, other community stakeholders is key to ensure success of those uh, initiatives. And uh, by engagement, we don't mean only symbolic engagement of local authorities, religious leaders, and other stakeholders, but their active support and their active involvement and participation in those activities. I have already brought a couple of examples how local authorities, municipality authorities in Bangladesh really supported and engaged in, in, in this type of activities. And we believe that through this type of engagement and support, it will be possible to enhance trust, enhance interaction and support for PDE initiatives at the local level. We also believe, and uh, it has been observed through our experience, that there is a need of local level PDE action plans to ensure coordinated response. Local communities uh, know better their needs and they know better how to address and how to respond to, the, to, to these needs. And from our experience in other countries uh, where uh, national level uh, PCV policies and local level PCV action plans are in place, we could really see the, how successful and how coordinated those actions can be. Those were very briefly some of the um, highlights from our programs and some of the recommendations and observations that I, I, I wanted to share today. Uh, and um, I would be happy to share uh, additional information or materials if there is uh, interest and answer any question the uh, participants may have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Marine, uh, thank you so much uh, for that, uh, you know, whistle stop tour of all of the great work that uh, GSF and its partners are doing across Bangladesh. And thank you for drawing upon, I think, some of the key highlights. It's really interesting to see the breadth of the work. I think that also the locations that uh, you've been able to develop these partnerships in. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, really interesting um, ideas in some of these projects and programs that we can take forward and understand the learnings uh, from for uh, application across the wider region and indeed further afield. So thank you uh, very much uh, for taking us through that. Um, I'd like uh, just to uh, move on, if I may, into our second speaker uh, in the interest of time. I hope we'll get a chance to have a couple of questions to the panel at the end, uh, but let's see. Um, uh, so on to our second speaker. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome Robert Stolman. Uh, uh, to the floor today, uh, and I'm grateful for uh, his uh, joining us today. Uh, Rob is project manager uh, of Partnerships for a Tolerant Inclusive Bangladesh project, UNDP's flagship program on the prevention of violent extremism again in Bangladesh. Uh, previously, he's led UNDP field offices in Cox's Bazaar, Sitwe, Rakhine State uh, in Myanmar, uh, and Rangamati, uh, the Chittagong Hill Tracts. Um, uh, and he has a long experience uh, in peace building and conflict management with UNDP, uh, before which uh, he worked in HR and in project management in the maritime sector. Uh, but I think with a number of very useful uh, uh, and insightful um, contributions to this discussion, Rob, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks, uh, thanks, Daniel. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm in Bangladesh and I'm not, I'm outside Dhaka on a field mission. I uh, have to improvise a bit, but I can see from your face that you can, can hear me. <laughs> Good. Okay, let me start. Uh, so let me talk about the, uh, the partnership for a tolerant inclusive Bangladesh, what is UNDP's program in Bangladesh. And uh, but actually we work very close with different partners, particularly within the, within the UN, 
but I understand that my uh, dear colleague uh, Nadim will talk after me more about the UN uh, collaboration. So let me uh, focus on the Partnership for Tolerant Inclusive Bangladesh. I, I would first of all, I would like to talk more about our, uh, our uh, research work, uh, what mo mostly focusing on the role of uh, social media in the radicalization process. And then I will explain more about our program activities and also how we engage with local, uh, local authorities and local, uh, local partners. So, but first of all, our work on in research, in particular, on the uh, on the, on what's happening online, because the uh, the online radicalization uh, is, we see it as one of the biggest threats, and it's not just the uh, the online radicalization; it's also the overall intolerance that uh, violent extremists are propagating uh, on 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 online. So we're working actually with an international and a national partner. Uh, SECDEF is international, and national is is, is Rupantar, and they are systematically. Um, uh, following and monitoring um, all the violent extremist contents that comes online, which is targeting uh, Bangladesh. And, and over the years, actually, we have started from 2018. It, it's alarming uh, how these uh, channels and posts are still continuing, despite uh, uh, platforms uh, and contents are, are take, taken, taken down, uh, but also how news is, uh, is, is spreading also, uh, let's say, by, by non-violent uh, extremist uh, actors. Um, We've seen a huge, uh, huge increase in channels and uh, um, and and, in, and, in, and in engagement. I mean, I can tell you that, for instance, from 2018 when we started our work, uh, we found about 800,000 uh, uh, people subscribed to those uh, channels and and following and liking those uh, those posts, which is on a population of 166 million people. Of course, not a lot, uh, but we have seen how it uh, how it's gone up over the years gradually. And we have seen a, a number of peaks. I mean, one of them was, was COVID, but I also heard on the, from, from the last session, you know, what's the influence of COVID? Well, we have seen how it was a drastic increase in the number of subscriptions uh, in 2020. Uh, from the beginning of the year, 2.2 million up to 4.4 million uh, in the end of the year. Um, I mean, Munir Al Islam was also one of your speakers, and uh, before he was leading the, uh, the CDTC, and of course, we, we are. Uh, sharing and discussing our our findings, uh, the CDTC they really saw that you know that most likely what this what was behind was the, the closure of colleges and that people are more online and somehow yeah ex exploring uh, that is not uh, it, yeah it's 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 not a good thing but it's not that alarming, but I think what we have seen this year is even more alarming and that is the influence of the Taliban takeover, uh, which was also widely celebrated uh, in social media. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a victory of the uh, of Islam over uh, over the Western uh, Western world, and we've also seen how these uh, violent extremist narratives, of course, uh, and most of them actually they are affiliated to Al Qaeda, which we know is actually sympathetic to the Taliban. Uh, actually, we have seen how it can up at the moment to ten point eight million uh, subscriptions. So that's really a warning uh, a warning sign. So the the, uh, the social media is used in, in Bangladesh. It is uh, by far. Uh, the, uh, Facebook is most popular. It's about 7.9 million uh, subscriptions. Uh, but then um, uh, YouTube is also on the rise, and particularly in the more rural, rural areas, more and more people are having uh, 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 mobile phones where they can watch uh, 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 contents. It's an easier way to uh, to to reach uh, uh, illiterate people. Uh, but we also see that the Telegram. Uh, Twitter uh, and Instagram is used, uh, and there is potential for TikTok, although it is not that uh, that uh, that used so so often. So what we see, uh, because we, we are monitoring it for two reasons: is uh, first of all, is, is to understand the narratives used by the violent extremists, so what do they want to propagate, and, se and second is then these numbers, which I already spoke about. But if you're looking at the narratives, that they always have been extremely opportunistic and always responding. Uh, to events, and, and and you can see that those violent extremists have a very good finger on the pulse and good understanding about the sentiments of the people in Bangladesh. I can give you the example of the Rohingya crisis, when the Rohingya villages were attacked in 2016. Uh, this was prominently displayed in violent extremist uh, 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 videos, and, and they were ca calling on helping the, the Muslim brothers and sisters in Myanmar. When the first refugees came uh, uh, into Bangladesh, they were calling on the Bangladeshis to support the refugees. They were even calling the young bachelor uh, Bangladeshi men uh, to marry uh, Rohingya girls. But when the sentiments were changing, where people were getting more concerned about the large uh, Rohingya presence and when they're getting frustrated that uh, there was a little uh, view of that uh, they were ever returned, uh, then the narratives of the violent extremists also turned down. And we have seen the same thing also how they have used uh, uh, COVID-19 
uh, what's, what's most alarming is that, um, uh, and, and I think it's known that, that Al-Qaeda has a kind of vision, is they call the long jihad, uh, in which they are trying to fuel um, intolerance and, and, and also a violence, and not particular direct violent extremist attacks, but intolerance towards, uh, towards minorities. Uh, very strong uh, in Bangladesh is the, uh, the anti-Hindu uh, sentiments, and my colleague from GSERF was already mentioning the, the recent attacks during the uh, uh, during the, the Durga Puja, but we also see that LGBTQ, uh, secularism, uh, democracy, but also women empowerment are, are targeted. I mean, we have even seen how uh, violent extremists were trying to target uh, and uh, to uh, to attack, uh, let's say, a, a propaganda-wise, uh, uh, simple things like uh, like breast uh, breastfeeding bank. So it's an it's really feeding into this overall sense of uh, of intolerance, and I mean, and, and and that we see as a major risk. So. Just to say also quickly about uh, about Afghanistan, uh, uh, definitely you know this is this is praised as an uh, as a victory. Uh, it's calling on other people to follow the uh, the examples. Uh, they're also calling for attacks, but luckily we do not actually see they are very successful in in calling uh, actually violent extremist attacks. But again, this this overall uh, use of the of the Taliban uh, taking over. And that all those values which were uh, so-called imposed to the Afghanistan, uh, like the, the women's rights, uh, they're all blamed uh, as, as Western, uh, Western IDs. And, and so we can see that, those, that the Taliban victory is actively used to further propagate intolerance in, uh, in Bangladesh, which is a very dangerous, uh, dangerous uh, thing to do. Let me see. Yeah, so then, then talking about our program. Um, so we're talking about uh, PVE, and I was also heard in the earlier uh, uh, session, it was discussed that uh, maybe we do CV, but we do not PVE. Well, I mean, the way how we look at PVE is that uh, we want to unpack it. And uh, so, so we see two major um, uh, threats that we want to address. I mean, first of all, it is this on-run radicalization and the violent extremist narratives online, and there is the growing intolerance. So talking about the first, um, we, we really want to promote a kind of, as we call it, the digital literacy and digital citizenship model, uh, because in, in terms of, of, of effectively um, uh, countering or, or, or trying to mitigate the risk of, of online radicalization, uh, we first of all believe that digital literacy and citizenship is, is a really important way, because actually many, many people actually are just following and liking messages without knowing the real, the real harms of it. And I can give you an example of those recent attacks, what the GSERF colleague mentioned, about uh, against Hindu um, uh, communities. This was also started through a social media post. And, and we have met with, uh, and on Facebook, and we have met with Facebook uh, short after that, uh, that attack and to see, you know, how we could collaborate in, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, mitigating this sort of risk and try, try to, to, to bring contents down. And, and Facebook was also sharing that, you know, uh, it took them more than four days uh, to, to remove those contents. And there were difficulties because some people on purpose were sharing it and they were tra changing pixels and making it difficult to recognize. But, but mostly, actually, a lot of people out of innocence, they were just sharing and liking those, those, uh, those posts. And that's how it was spreading throughout the media. So making people more aware about, uh, about uh, digital literacy is, is one thing that we look at. And we work with youth and we capacitate the youth. And the other way is about the uh, the uh, Rob. The can I just ask? I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, Rob. Would, you, yeah. would I? Would you kindly just uh, draw your remarks to to a close in the next minute or so? I will. Thanks. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so, so the other point is the uh, the global the, the intolerance. Uh, we want to, to to strengthen the voices of diversity. So 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 making this this diverse voices heard in social media, but also in the media. And talking about about working with local partners, uh, we strongly believe in building capacity and research. We think. Research is the key. You cannot implement a, a, a PVE program without proper proper research. And so we are working with the Dhaka universities, but also with, with NGOs, uh, and, and particularly also looking, building their capacity in terms of, 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 of social, uh, social media. Local authorities, we also work close, but we don't call it PVE. We work with issues around diversity and tolerance at the uh, more at the local, uh, local government uh, uh, level, because we think that is much more effective and, and, and I mean, th this is what we actually want to do. We want to nurture diversity. We want to, to attack the intolerance, which is a kind of breeding ground for violent extremism. So I, I, my advice is that if you want to work on PV, try to unpack it, try to, try to, to identify what are the areas where you should focus on and, and call it like that, but, uh, but don't call it uh, entrepreneurship for PVE or I don't know, there are all sorts of programs. 
I mean, I mean, I mean, give it the name that you actually want to uh, to work on. Sorry for for crossing my time limit. Thanks. Rob, not at all. It, it was extremely helpful contribution, and I think um, covered mm -hmm. a lot of ground in that time. So thank you so much for for mm -hmm. taking the time to to, to join us and and provide those uh, remarks. And uh, I can see Nadim. Uh, who we'll, we'll hear from in just a moment. Uh, Rob, I think some really important uh, points that you made there throughout. Uh, I know that a lot of the discussion focused on the online, the, the evolution of the online threat and some of the research um, and insights that are coming out um, from yourselves and from, from partners on this, which I think is extremely important. And there's obviously a huge uh, appetite for understanding and uh, uh, analysis of this. Uh, and I know uh, my colleague has kindly posted our, our Bangladesh um, policy paper on, on this, which I think is, is helpful. Um, it's really important that we understand many of the points that, that you're talking about, platform migration, uh, the key narratives and the change of those narratives, the increasing sort of interlinking narratives that we're seeing, um, the impact of the pandemic and how that has um, uh, changed both sort of user um, user uh, uh, profiles and user types, uh, but also I think uh, uh, also, you know, left its mark on some of the narratives and, and ways of practically how sort of hate and extremist speech content online is evolving and, uh, and, and being shared with such um, uh, agility across the online sphere. It's also, of course, important that we marry that up with an understanding of what's taking place at the community level. And, and when those two uh, uh, pieces of analysis can speak uh, to one another, then I think we have a real chance of being able to bring in the right partners to uh, address the key trends. So thank you, uh, Rob. I, I think you know you leave us with this thought of um, working with local authorities on diversity and tolerance, and, and that's how you frame your cooperation with local authorities, local governments. I think that's really important. I'd like to explore that a little more um, when we have some uh, a chance for some some questions. Uh, just a quick follow up question then to to, to Rob next. Rob, uh, you know, building on your contribution and that of Nadim, um, uh, you know, the Strong Cities Network exists to to, to promote and expand the <clears throat> the mandate and role of, of of local governments, specifically of city governments. And in Bangladesh, you know, we've worked mm -hmm. very closely with city corporations in in Dhaka North, South, Naranganj. We've uh, you know had good uh, outreach in in Rajshahi, Khulna, uh, Chittagong. Uh, 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 you know, around the country. And, and I think it's, um, uh, you know, really important that we are able not only to just work at the local level and, and ensure that there is capacity training and access to, to, to global practice, but also that we are able to uh, effectively elevate those experiences up both to, to, to governments and of course to, to multilateral partners, whether that's UN, whether it's SARC, as one of our speakers talked about earlier, whether it's uh, all manner of different fora mm. dealing either, you know, explicitly or implicitly with the challenges that we're discussing today. Um, mm. Rob, how can we do that more effectively? Uh, uh, and how can the UN be a partner for cities uh, more effectively uh, across South Asia on, on, on this? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think we need to to look for in the areas where we can really uh, uh, collaborate. So I, I I can't speak for outside Bangladesh, but for, let's say for for inside Bangladesh, and this is also something I I would say that we also starting to look at is uh, um, we think that that the, the PVE uh, uh, is something and especially the responses should be mainstreamed in program activities. Uh, we do not believe in dedicated only PVE uh, uh, responses. Um, but I think the, uh, I mean, first of all, I think there can be a close collaboration in terms of research. And, um, and you know, we are focusing, uh, I work a lot on, uh, on social media, media analysis that we're getting our work for. But we also realize that uh, this is giving a good idea about, uh, about, uh, about trends, isn't it? But if you really want to understand the cause of people, uh, you need also to get your information from the, from the people itself. Yeah, so I, I and, and we also know that, you know, looking at the, the population at risk, uh, it's mostly young people who are uh, uh, online are exposed to this news. Uh, definitely, uh, we are trying to understand actually, you know, um, uh, some some ideas about the geographical uh, coverage of those extremists and where are most. But I think you can assume that, let's, but particularly in the big uh, uh, city corporation uh, like uh, Dhaka and Chodogram, uh, that there are a lot of uh, followers on the, on that news. Uh, so I think first of all the research. 
uh, but also the digital literacy. The digital literacy, I think, is so important. Uh, but again, you know, this uh, this can be mainstreamed in existing programs. I mean, we don't think that you should call a youth group together and said, okay, now we're going to uh, train you on the prevention of violent extremism. We think it's better to chip in 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 in, uh, in, uh, in training programs for youth and and then try to. And, and like, like, for instance, UNESCO was mentioned here, but UNESCO is doing a lot of training on the civic education. And, 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 and it's, it's about interfaith, it's about tolerance, and, 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 and digital literacy is part of that. And of course, you can come up with some examples about the threats of violent extremism. So I, I, I would say there are two areas we could, could work in, in the research, see you know, how we can actually get yeah. a better uh, situation from, from the real people, uh, and, and then see how in, 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 in ongoing, and I would say particularly on youth, you know, how you could mainstream some of those research findings and things like digital literacy, uh, fighting intolerance into, into regular programs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Rob, that's really helpful. Yeah. And I think it, it, yeah. it helps us and our partners um, see mm -hmm. how there is, you know, real potential for, for, for greater collaboration. I think um, mm -hmm. cities are often sort of too easily dismissed as irrelevant to the challenge mm -hmm. of violence per se. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, you know, obviously, uh, tends to be the remit of national governments of security agencies but actually when you come to the nuts and bolts of the wider societal prevention uh, uh, challenge you come to the research components of that and then the action whether that's digital literacy as you say or others they're, they're front and center of 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 how we provide a coordinated response and uh, you know for for city partners that we work with um uh, you know we're dealing with with uh, you know outstanding local leaders who who might be dealing from one minute to you know problems of um, sanitization and uh, mm. waste disposal to registering births, deaths, marriages, mm. new businesses mm. in the local area, um, uh, uh, and then of course they're having sort of discussions around here around well how do I understand what my role is, what my remit is, what authority mm. I have on this bigger issue that's often quite politicized uh, around. Uh, violent extremism and I think um, opening uh, the beginnings of a sort of safe space for that relationship mm. uh, and role I think has been something that that we've uh, hoped to do over the, the, the recent years and I think hope to, to build on going forward and so you know we very much welcome the partnership with uh, with UN agencies mm. uh, not just in Bangladesh but across the region and I hope that these are things that we can continue to explore very quickly I just want to have uh, one last comment uh, from um, uh, Marine. Uh, Marine, can I just pose the, the, the question um, uh, around sustainability here? Because you, you, you've talked a lot about support to, to civil society partners. Uh, you know, what's the perspective on sustainability for those programs that, that GSEF has? And, and how perhaps do you think a stronger role for cities could support sustainability uh, at a civil society level? Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. And I, I should just say, because we are so uh, uh, tight for time, um, I, I would just ask, um, I know Dr. Mubin and others perhaps have some questions. Um, Mubin, if you can, if you post them in, in the, the Q&A box, that would be so helpful. And uh, if we can't address them uh, in the discussion, then, then I hope we can provide answers. And indeed, as we have follow-ups, which we have over the next two days, perhaps address some of those questions. So um, please do do that. But Maureen, back to you. Uh, thoughts on sustainability and how cities can support that. Thank you so much. It's a really a very important question and key aspect of um, our programs, what we do in Bangladesh to try to achieve sustainability of youth platforms. It has been already um, six work, uh, six, six, sorry, six years we are working in Bangladesh and now um, we are also uh, trying to see together with our partners and together with you how to ensure sustainability of their actions. And uh, I think cities and municipalities have a role in that because by supporting uh, young people to continue engaging in those actions, even beyond the funding by the donors, this will be a part of the sustainability. Uh, I know that uh, some of the youth, uh, youth platforms are willing uh, to register and continue their work independently. And I think this is also one of the uh, signs or indicators that at least some of those youth platforms can become independent and sustainable and continue working without um, further funding from, uh, from the donors. But I think it would be important to 
um, to ensure support by the local stakeholders, including municipalities, community level stakeholders, to make sure that young people are really um, able to learn from their experience, to um, enhance their collaboration with the local authorities and municipalities and continue their work. So they will need, uh, I think, support to um, uh, continue enhancing their capacity to maybe to register at least some of the youth, youth platforms and to become uh, more um, sustainable. Marine, thank you so much um, for, for responding to that. I think it's a really tough question, but it's so important as we look at um, you know, how we fund partnerships, how we support these partnerships, you know, what the technical um, uh, support aspect is, but, but fundamentally, you know, the, the whole question that we've examined in this panel has been one of coordination, understanding the different roles uh, of the different partners that, that are involved here, and ultimately, you know, the, the role that cities can play in, in speaking up to, um, informing, and also, uh, uh, you know, delivering on uh, the work of, of uh, multilateral partners, governments, uh, and of course, partnering in that with civil society organizations. So thank you um, to all uh, our speakers, all three of our uh, speakers uh, on the second panel, and indeed to all of the distinguished speakers who uh, have joined us throughout today's session. Um, unfortunately, um, we are, uh, I'm afraid, just out of time for a further discussion, though there are so many points that I would like to pick up on. Um, I, this has been such a helpful beginning to uh, our discussion throughout this South Asia Summit. As I said at the beginning, this is uh, day one of three days over which we will host uh, two hour long uh, webinar discussions. Uh, so these uh, will give an opportunity, I think, to, to explore the questions and, and, and thoughts that come as a result of today's discussion. Uh, we'll also have um, uh, discussions that move forward in terms of the thematic focus. Tomorrow, for instance, we will address uh, how local governments can coordinate and cooperate more and more with national governments and how we can strengthen that vertical national local cooperation, which is a key tenet, if you like, of what uh, the Strong Cities Network does uh, globally. Uh, and indeed, we've worked with the uh, uh, Global Counterterrorism Forum to uh, produce the best practices globally on, on how we strengthen that um, uh, cooperation. But really, in practice, it comes down to the partnerships at the country by country level. So as we address that tomorrow, uh, I invite you all to join as we look at that across uh, the South Asia region. Uh, and then, of course, we'll have uh, our final session as part of this summit on uh, Wednesday. Uh, and that will look at uh, uh, multi-actor uh, models and how we can work across multiple stakeholders, which of course was um, uh, a key uh, question that, that, that came up today. Um, so uh, without further ado then, it, you know, it remains for me to, to, to thank everybody for contributing to today's discussion. I'd like just to close with a, a very quick um, uh, window into how we want to go forward from today. Uh, and how we want to go forward on the back of the work that we as the network have done across South Asia and indeed globally uh, over the past six years. Um, uh, I think that we have had an incredible opportunity to uh, secure membership across uh, uh, many countries. Uh, some of those members have been engaged with us in very, very, very grassroots hyper-local work uh, and there are partnerships and relationships there on a day-to-day -day basis. Others have joined uh, as their needs may uh, require for uh, specific uh, sessions, exchanges, uh, global summits, uh, uh, and uh, so there is, a, I think, a diverse experience of what the SCN has been able to deliver for its members. Um, uh, and I think going forward, as we laid out really in our UN session earlier this year, and as we are laying out through these series of regional uh, summits at the end of the year, uh, uh, we are uh, turning to a strategy now of um, uh, supporting regional hubs across key regions where Strong Cities Network is active. We want to uh, promote a better cooperation uh, uh, and engagement between uh, countries uh, uh, in key regions where we are engaged. We don't want that to be limited just to one country where there are deep dive uh, programs uh, and then with nothing between that and the global level coordination, I think it's really important that we uh, kickstart and drive forward regional cooperation. So uh, a South Asia 
uh, regional hub is planned uh, to be launched next year. And I think that's really exciting. I think it's an opportunity for everybody uh, today to be engaged with us. Uh, we hope to staff those regional hubs in the region uh, and you know, be there to, to develop the relationships and direct support to cities that this network was set up to, to do. Um, fundamentally, I, I also think that you know, we have ha had you know, the privilege of being able to uh, work with a number of partners on very deep dive programs, but there's a real need here to build out the networking function. And that isn't just to give everybody the opportunity to, uh, when it's permitted, travel and engage in, in, in conference centers. It's much, much more about uh, making sure that the lessons are really being transferred and learned uh, globally, uh, and that we really can do what we've been talking about today, which is elevate the voices of local leaders and practitioners and stakeholders, uh, not only upwards to their national governments, but more globally. Um, so uh, a regional hub for South Asia, uh, more work uh, on uh, the networking component of the Strong Cities Network, um, uh, continuing to support then our uh, uh, grassroots uh, work as well. Uh, so with that, uh, I just remind everybody uh, uh, of our session uh, tomorrow on national local cooperation. I thank everybody uh, for contributing to this uh, very wide ranging and helpful uh, framing discussion today. Uh, and I wish you all uh, uh, a wonderful rest of your day. So thank you very much for joining us.